Thanks for that introduction. Uh, so, yeah, just a little on my background. Um, grad school, it was the whole bioinformatics, computational biology, uh, genomics, proteomics. In my mind, I was doing data science. Um, my passion was just give me some nice data and I want to solve a problem. I joined bioinformatics because I thought that's a field that has a lot of good data. Um, I moved quickly into industry and I started doing healthcare. It's not really the same kind of data. Uh, after that, I did a little bit of social networking, and then my work at Banjo, which was event detection, and now at Sentient. So a little bit of the, on the Banjo. So I was there for, for the last two years. I just started at Sentient. Um, at Banjo, basically, we consume all of um, social media in real time. So if you post anything on Twitter, Instagram, Vcontacte from Russia, Weibo from China, anything with um, geolocation, We'd consume it and push it through our deep learning models. And so we would extract from images objects, scenery, actions, and brands. And so you can like instantly query the world and say, show me everybody that's on a beach with sushi drinking a Coke. And it would just, just show you. Of course, there's not an application for that. I mean, that's impressive of a demo just to see that. But I think the application was brands wanted to understand their customers. That was one application. The other one was just news. We broke news stories because we detected fires, protests, uh, crashes, uh, floods through imagery. Um, it's way more telling than text. Text is actually harder. There's a lot of nuance to it. And if you're just looking for the word fire, you're going to get a thousand to one at least false positive ratio. Um, so we would serve like CNN, NBC, and all those. We usually beat the news by about two hours when they didn't use our product. And then there was Wall Street, which we detected like an oil pipeline exploding 40 minutes before the price of crude oil started to go up. Amazon data center caught fire last year. We detected it. Um, came out in the news an hour and a half later. But the price for Amazon stock started to drop like five minutes after we detected it, which told us something we already knew. Wall Street, they know about the news way before the news. I mean, like more than an hour before the news. Um, they just pay more money to get the news. Um, and that was, that was interesting as well. And the Amazon actually was a good example because the text said, great day at work or some, something sarcastic like that. You know, so if you were just looking at the text, you wouldn't be able to tell that the picture, there was a giant building on fire. Uh, so that was really interesting to see that example. This talk is not going to be about cool new methodologies as much as I like them and as much as I have used them. We can talk about that later. It's more about what's really like to, to work in the field and what problems do I see uh, with data scientists. Um, so at Banjo was the first time that I actually grew a team from scratch. I, I was working there by myself for three months and then slowly hired one, two, three. And then by the time I left, it was 13 people on the data science team. Com company went from 30 to about 100 people. Um, and basically expected to do the same thing now. So hopefully this will be useful. Uh, for preparing to go to the real world and uh, that kind of experience. I just want to talk about one methodology first that I'm, I really love. 
I think it's very elegant, um, as much as I use deep learning more than ensembles. But I think ensembles are really powerful, and probably most of you are familiar. But I mean, in my book, right, the first ensemble is actually from 1905. Uh, this guy, Mr. Galton, uh, was at one of those county fairs where you're supposed to guess the, the weight of a, of a cow. And there were some experts guessing, and then there's the public guessing, experts being, you know, farmers that had cows and dealt with cows. And he found out that if you just took the average of everybody's guess, that was the best guess, better, better than any of the experts. And it kind of makes sense in your head um, if you picture like um, a dartboard, right? And you have experts trying to hit the bullseye. And if you have like a thousand people, maybe a million people throwing darts, and everyone makes a different kind of mistake, you're basically going to just cover completely the dartboard. And then the average is exactly the middle. And that actually is a very nice analogy to the two real constraints in data science to ensembles, which are, one, you need to guarantee um, that the models in the ensemble are at least better than random. And two, you need to try to guarantee that the models are different from each other. If you have those two things, you have a good ensemble. I mean, the example, obviously, with the dartboard is if everybody's left-handed, everybody makes a mistake to the left, your average is not going to be good. The second example is if your players are not better than random, I guess in this case, they'd be throwing it on the floor or on their foot, and it's so distant from the, you know, it's going to basically pull down your average. So this is just a simple example of suppose the top row is like the targets you're trying to predict. Every other row is a model that's exactly 60% accurate. And there's no tricks here. This is real. And the bottom is just the average of all the models. And the AUC of the average is 100%. Obviously, this is a really nicely put example. But it shows that you don't even have to have powerful methods within the ensemble. As long as they make different mistakes from each other, it averages out really nicely. Um, and then I just wanted to show a little bit on the power of ensembles. And basically, what you see here is three sets of problems, each row here is a problem. Each column is a methodology in machine learning, right? Nearest neighbors is the first one, linear SVMs. Uh, you've got the RBF ones, decision trees, random force, and so forth. And you can see that for the same problem, right, each one of them is going to try to solve the problem differently. And in real examples, you're never going to be able to visualize this, right? The dimensionality is going to be too big. Even if you do dimensionality reduction, you're not really capturing all the real decision boundaries of the problem. So you never have this, this luxury. And I mean, if you choose the wrong method, you can see here, I mean, you're really missing out and you won't know. And ensembles actually have a nice smooth property to them. You're averaging a bunch of methods and you can end up with any complex shape decision boundary you want. And it's also smoothed out so that, um, you know, if you have like outliers, they're not gonna help you, basically force you to overfit. This is just the same example, three different data sets. But here you see like a single decision tree and then five trees, 10 trees, 20 trees, and 50 trees. And the model's not only getting better, but it's getting smoother, right? The advantage of a random forest is one, it can make lines that are not perpendicular to the decision to the uh, space. Decision trees obviously can only make uh, cuts that are, well, parallel to the, to the dimensions. Uh, random forests allow you to do diagonal lines by averaging them. And then it, you get the smoother effect uh, as well. So, that, that's all I want to talk about for, for as far as ensembles. Um, so here we go. This is just going to be a bunch of, of slides that are not, each one just stands on its own in, in things that I find important. So defining a goal for a model, ensuring that result of a good model will match the company's goal. Uh, you'd think that this is obvious, and probably you'll think most of the stuff I'm saying here today is obvious, and it happens more than you'd expect. It happens more often than not. And especially this one, the communication between people in the company and the data scientists is very poor. And they're kind of usually isolated in some companies. And they get these ideas of models to build and achieving amazing results. And if the business doesn't know how to use that, it's useless, right? So defining the problem and coming up with that target that you want to train on is, is just crucial. And I'll, I'll actually give you an example. Uh, a few slides later with real examples that I've, that I've seen. So first, just looking at the data. Again, you'd be surprised how many people never look at the data. So you will catch yourself in the future doing this, guaranteed at some point in time. Um, seeing where the data comes from. So this is before actually analyzing the data. This is just asking questions like, they say, here's this data, train this model for us. 
And they didn't realize, because they're not data scientists, they're scraping off and not saving tons of valuable information. And if you don't ask, you're not going to know. So you could have the best features possible that are just not given to you because they thought, oh, yeah, we, we threw that away as we, as we pull it in. Or something that's worse, which is they'll give you data with certain features that you wouldn't get in production in real time. So you build this model, and now you can't put the model in production because, oh, yeah, that data actually comes after the fact. So really simple stuff like that on just understanding, okay, where does the data come from? What's the path of the data? How does it get to my hands, right, basically? And then still in the looking at the data uh, theme, looking at the data, now not you know, where it came from, et cetera, but actually looking at the data, looking at the features, plotting a bunch of statistics about it. Just look at it. Sometimes you'll find things that are, you'll find a bug on how the data was stored, right? And then you're not wasting. I've seen, I've seen people waste two, two months and then they get these results and there's this awkwardness and then they go back, oh yeah, I didn't look at the data. There's some stupidity on how, on how the data was being stored. Or sometimes it's just to actually understand that there's something obvious that you should be doing Right? Anytime you can digest, pre-digest the, the data for the model, it's better. I mean, models are powerful. Deep learning is powerful. Random forest is powerful. It's more powerful when you do some of the work for them, right? So you can say, well, if I have two features, X and Y, and I find out that, you know, whatever, X to the power of Y is super valuable. Sure, uh, any, any of those complicated methods can learn that. But it's not going to learn it as well if you, if you just give it to it, right? So if it's something that you can figure out to feed the, the model, that's always a better choice. It's boring. It's not exciting sometimes. And uh, it's not easy. But uh, it, you'll get better results that way. And then data cleanup. Uh, so mainly here on, on um, labels. So mislabeled data, you'll never get clean sets. If you guys participate in Kaggle, or if you guys get data sets for homework assignments, that is way cleaner. Even the dirty sets from Kaggle, way cleaner than stuff you're going to get in industry. And industry is going to be a mess, and it's going to be on you to, to make sure that that's clean. So don't, you know, look at the labeling and understand what the labeling is. Um, and sometimes it's not that it's mislabeled. It's that the labels don't really match what they want you to give, right? They're like, you know, give us a model that predicts this, but the labels are like slightly off of what they mean. So understanding, you know, the labels. And then still with the data, again, I mentioned, you know, feature engineering. So, you know, I've, I've had some uh, participation, and I know a few people that run uh, Kaggle, um, and I've chatted with them, actually the former president. And, you know, one thing, excluding things that deep learning is really well known for, so image, sound, sometimes text, ensembles win every single time, every single competition in the last like 10 years or the whole existence of, of Kaggle. If it's not deep learning because it's image, it's, it's ensembles. And it's not that people don't know how to use ensembles. The, the, so everybody's gonna use ensembles. You're not gonna win by using ensembles. You're gonna win by doing feature engineering and then doing ensembles. And that's how um, I've collaborated actually with three of the top 10 guys from Kaggle and that's all they do. They don't even care about, forget the modeling, that's the last part. It's 90% of the time feature engineering. It's the only way people win Kaggle competitions, which means it's the way you should be building you know, very good models. Information is gold. Never throw information away. Again, that's either on the part of when the data gets to you or actually on your own part. Um, if there's any other information you can bring in, even if it's not already given to you, you need to bring it in. There's no reason anymore in this day and age to leave out features. You're not, if you know what you're doing, you're not going to run the risk of overfitting. You can put as many features as you want, and you should, right? Even if it means bringing metadata from other sources, scraping online, being scrappy basically is a, is a really nice feature to have as a data scientist. You're, you're able to scrape things, able to go and, and find data, uh, and, you know, and use resources. Okay, so don't try to make a fantastic model, and if you do, don't trust it. So there's some caveats here, obviously, but um, don't try. And this is 90% of data scientists are tinkerers, and you'll waste so much time on useless tinkering where you build something, you get to a certain level, 
you start tinkering a little bit and you see some improvements. You go from 93 to 97%, and then you get hooked on it, right? Like a drug, you're like, oh, I tinkered a little. I got, you know, 3%, 4%. I'm going to keep tinkering. And then, you know, weeks later, you're still at 97%, and you don't know when to stop. And most data scientists don't know when to stop. So that's what I mean. If you have something good today, it should be in production today. You'll start making money for your company. Tinkering may be optional, might not be necessary, depending on the way they're using the model. 90%, 95, 96, 97 might not make any difference, even 80. It really depends on the usage. So knowing when to stop messing with parameters is important. And if you do, don't trust it. I've seen many, many times, a lot of companies, somebody gets really excited about some really good results, and they don't stop to use common sense and think, is that really possible? They just go, yes, 99% AUC. And, you know, it's a bug, more often than not. So anytime you get a really good model, the first reaction you should have is, oh, I have a bug in my code. Because it's, it's, it's what it is. So every time, just say that to yourself. It's a bug. And go look for that bug. Um, and, and knowing, you know, using common sense, right? So one of the projects I worked on was hospital readmissions. When you're sending the person home, what's the chance that he's going to come back with a condition? Because he has, whatever, pneumonia, COPD, heart failure. And we have all the data. We have history, medications, lab work, blood work, demographics, everything about the guy, right? I would not trust my model if I got anywhere close to 90%. Because there's just no way. Think about it. You think you can predict if somebody's going to come back? I mean, think about all the randomness that has nothing to do with your features, right? The guy is single. The guy's an idiot. He's going to go out drinking. He's not going to do what the doctor said. You don't have that data. That's going to determine if he comes back or not. Or the guy's married. He has a nice wife that takes care of him. He's going through depression. Like all these life factors, right, that there's no way you should know. So that probably accounts for so much of who comes back to the hospital that even if you have a 1,000 years from now the best model in the world and you're the most intelligent data scientist in the world, you just can't achieve 90%, period. You, you can't. It's just not in the data. And you should be able to think through before you even start looking at your results and think, okay, what do I think is acceptable here? What do I think is my limitation on going from features to, to target? And sometimes the data is complete. And sometimes you believe you can actually get to 100%. And you'll be right. Uh, just, you know, usually just don't trust it. Just look for bugs. Or actually data leak, right? Data leak is super important. So um, training and testing on the same data accidentally happens a lot, a lot a lot, a lot, um, or having some kind of data leak of features where you're building features based on the future. So you have this data set that's a time series, and you're doing a great job of splitting training and testing. But when you wrote the code that creates these features, you don't realize that your features are actually grabbing some information from the future. And that's you know a data leak, but it happens a lot. Never overcomplicate um, your solution, problem, or life. If you can do it stupid and easy, do it stupid and easy. Reduces the chances for bugs. It's also faster, doesn't require research, and it gives you a baseline, a benchmark. Always start with the simplest thing possible. And every time you think you're doing the simplest thing possible, stop and think, is it really the simplest thing possible? Probably it isn't. Uh, and you should just think about the assumptions you're making um, in your head that are preventing you from seeing the really simple, dumb thing that you can do. Um, that makes it very easy for you to say, I will be done in three days, and not, oh, I'll be done in three days, oh, I need a few more days, I need a few more days, I need a few more days, because I'm trying to, you know, optimize something or um, develop something new. So do something simple to get a baseline and see where you are at with the data and the problem you have. This is a fantastic example of some of the things that I just mentioned. Um, this is a paper. I couldn't believe it when I read it. I didn't think it would ever be published because basically this paper says every paper that came before this paper in this field is complete garbage. And that's hard to publish. They were trashing some big names. They were trashing some papers that were being used at like Goldman Sachs to be tr to, for trading algorithms. And they said complete junk. And I was shocked. And they're right. And they're so right. And it's, it's not hard to see. And they show it very nicely. It's uh, Subsequence analysis of time series. So basically, if you have, like, pretend this is a stock, right? And this is, let's say, a day. You can look at it as not sub series or subsequence, which means look at a whole day, 
get all the days you have in your data set and try to find some patterns in the data, right? Sub, sub sequence means you see the, the first, the, all the squiggly lines here in the beginning, right? You're getting a time window and you're looking at what that looks like shifting by a little bit of time, which means for every shape you have here, you're going to look at it from all the different possible angles. And what they showed is they proved their point in three ways, which I thought was fantastic. They did it mathematically, which was great. They did it by just using common English and common sense and explaining it, which was great. And then they gave examples and said, okay, there's if three ways for you to believe what we're saying. And the example they gave was they got the biggest paper, which I think was related to, to one of the, the Wall Street firms, and they got the results. And the results were given all these stocks, and this is the, you know, what they look like. These are some patterns that we found from clustering that we can use to trade. These are like key patterns, right? So what they did was they generated completely random data, and then they ran that through that algorithm, and they got the exact same results. So, I mean, if you're getting the same results from real trading data and from random data, that means you're not getting absolutely you know, anything. And the reason is people always find something valuable even if you give them junk, right? They're looking at it and they're trying to tell themselves, yeah, this is useful. They're going to find a few examples that by chance are like actually useful and they believe the result, but you know, they didn't do the common sense test. Like, is this really different from random? And so th this paper blew me away. It was just really good to see that happen and open some eyes. So using intuition is, is important. Um, so in industry, Pretty much always there's going to be three drivers for what you do in your daily life. It's going to be external, internal, and your own driven project. So external meaning outside your company, clients come and say, we want this, and then they're going to push the data science team to build it. Internal being other teams within the company need a product for themselves. They go to data science to do it. And then your own meaning, you're a data scientist. You should look at the data, and you should give ideas because a lot of times, you'll think, oh yeah, this is so obvious. I mean, they must have thought of it and they decided not to do it. But no, they didn't think of it. I mean, you're coming in with a fresh pair of eyes, you're a data scientist, you should be making suggestions and having ideas of how to use the data. Um, and so it's important to keep the balance of those three things, the, the three you know, ways of getting projects done on a, on a data science team. Yeah, I can't say this enough. I should have written this 100 times on this slide. Always make sure people understand what you're saying. Always make sure people understand what you're saying. I guarantee you, every single meeting you will have, somebody's going to walk out not knowing exactly what you said, but they think they do. Every time. Every time. Um, and so communication is super important. Um, repeating what you're saying as, as, you know, like it just sounds wrong when you say something so many times in a row, but it's different languages that you're speaking. Uh, and there will be this miscommunication happening all the time. And you'll have other parts of the company understanding, oh, yeah, that guy's building this for, for you, for me. And you think you're building something else. And then when you deliver, there's this giant problem, a clash of like, wait a minute, you know, this is not what we talked about. So communication is super important. And one of the things that I think data scientists as a whole should work on very strongly uh, is communication. I think it's, it's a weakness there. Not just the data scientist's fault, sometimes the company's fault as well, just how they interact. Uh, but this is super important. Again, this is back to the tinkering, so do not get distracted. Usually there's going to be three different things, right? The methods, that's what I talked about already. You just playing, what if I do this neural network? What if I add another layer? What if I add three more neurons? Um, side projects, so you know, you're meant to do A, and then you think, ooh, as I'm doing A, right, that puts me really close to being able to do B, so I should do B as well. And you'll talk to your boss and you'll say that and he'll say, great. But what he's not thinking in his head is that you're going to actually not deliver on A as fast because you're doing B. He's imagining that you're saying you're going to deliver A and B at the same time. Um, and that's not going to happen. So you need to be very clear if you do want to do B, decide how valuable it is and explain, hey, it's going to delay A, so let's focus on A first. Um, because a lot of times the side projects are more interesting and data scientists like to do things that are exciting and interesting. So um, modification of a project. So again, you have A and you think, you know, wouldn't it be better if we did A star? 
And somebody will say yes. And maybe a star is just a little harder. And sometimes you'll be stuck and you feel like, you know, you forget that you could just go back to A and deliver that, right? And you keep, you know, spinning your wheels on trying to deliver a star because now everybody in the company is sold that they want that. But, you know, what they really needed was just A. And so you should go back and think, okay, I made this project a little bigger than what it should be. I need to be able to go back. Compromises. Um, this is the A to A star, but that's coming from somebody else. It's always going to happen. Oh, you're doing this? Oh, you should do this too. And you should do that too. And maybe you should make your algorithm be able to do this. And you start compromising. Compromising is fine, but as long as you're not jeopardizing the project and you're the one that has to say that, you're, you, you have to speak up. Um, if you think that some modification of the project is going to maybe make it take longer or risk the, the probability that you're going to get a successful result, you need to speak up and make a decision based on that and let people know um, that that's happening. Presentation, people are not going to use what you make if they can't understand it or it's well presented. Um, I'm going to, again, give an example of a real project that I had in industry that was that. It was, you know, as long as it's presented well, we want something worse that's presented better than something better that's presented worse. Um, worse and better being the results, actually, versus the presentation. This is a list of things that you'll get in a silver platter in industry, and that's a complete list right there. So nothing, <laughs> absolutely nothing. And if you think you just got something on a silver platter, check again, because there's something wrong with what you got in that silver platter, because it's not. So sometimes it will happen, it's, you know, this beautiful thing, and you look at it and you're like, wow, I can't believe I just got that that easily. There's something wrong with it. There's probably something wrong with it. So. Make sure you do your homework. There's nothing easy. I just, I just thought this was a funny slide. I don't really have to say anything, do I? Um, no, but um, you will encounter problems that are not really solvable. So this is not me trying to say, oh, big data is great. This is just me saying, in the industry, you're going to run into a ton of problems where you just can't use all the data. You, the company doesn't have the resources. They don't have the computational power for whatever reason. You just can't, period. So figuring out smart ways of working around that, whether it's like, you know, using different kinds of machines, figuring out ways to parallelize it. Um, but you'll struggle with it. You know, it's going to beat you down. Um, and so just being smart about, can I figure out clever um, alternatives um, to using this big data and not waiting for the company to finally buy that big computer they've been promising for a year. And, you know, you're going to be waiting five more years before you actually get it. That happens too. Uh, time estimates. Data scientists are really bad at this. Really bad at this. Um, and part of it is all the other things we talked about, tinkering and you know, the fact that some of these projects are research-based. So breaking up into smaller manageable tasks, like I'm going to take a week to look at the data, and I'm going to give you at the end of the week what I think about the data. That's it, a report. right? You know that's going to take a week. You, you just have a week to look at the data. That's it. You're done in a week. right? Cleaning the data. Building the very first simple model where you're doing zero research, always important. So as long as you start breaking these up, it's going to be easy for you not to say, oh, yeah, sure, I'll be done in three weeks. And, you know, six weeks later, you're halfway there. Um, and then there's always going to be some steps that you can't break up. It's like, oh, I have to build the final model that does the final thing. Um, so breaking up into checkpoints to see if you're on the path still helps um, and gets you on track. And then it's a much easier conversation if early you say, hey, I'm going to be two weeks late, but that's, you know, two weeks from now that I'm going to be late versus today is the deadline and I'm going to be two weeks late, right? You don't want to be in that situation. Making assumptions. I'm going to pause here for a second. So I talked about making assumptions. Everybody makes assumptions every time. You just don't know you're making them. And as a matter of fact, most puzzles, physical puzzles and brain teasers, they rely on this for difficulty. If you're given a puzzle, the first thing you, you do is you create in your mind the solution space. And you think, wow, that's a big solution space. And you start searching for it. And you go through the whole solution space and you get to the end and you didn't find the solution. So then the first instinct that everybody has is go back. I didn't look hard enough, right? And you search the solution space again and again and again and again. And the reality is your solution space doesn't even include the solution. You made an assumption 
that constrain your solution space in a way that you could search forever and you're never going to find it. That's what makes puzzles and brain teasers hard. It's always assumptions. For example, right here, four sticks, making a plus sign, move one stick and make a square. Can anybody solve this? There's no tricks here. You like, I can't use a stick to move the other stick, you know? I'm not gonna blow on the sticks or tilt the table. Nothing 3D. This is like four matchsticks on a table. Just pick one matchstick up, put it down, make a square. You can raise your hand if you think you have the solution. Yeah? The stick is actually not straight, it is a... No, no, it's four, four perfect sticks. Yeah? But those are good, right? You're starting to think, you're starting not to make assumptions. I didn't say anything about breaking a stick, yeah? In the center? Yeah, that's possible. That's not the solution I was looking for, but that depends on how the sticks were originally touching each other, right? And that assumes a 3D-ness to their thickness. But that, that's actually correct. That's actually very clever. Um, so the, right, the solution really is that doesn't depend on how the sticks were, were initially arranged. Ta-da, four is a square, two, four, nine, those are squares. You assume there's a geometric square, and that is really simple, right? So assumptions, you will be making them every time. So now I'm can uh, gonna talk about some real world uh, examples of projects I've been involved in, and some of the things I saw you know, in them. So oh, this, is, this is just an example of like, a machine learning problem you might get in a classroom or a competition. And you know, sometimes it can sound really complicated, right? Like this is a really difficult task. This is actually easy, right? This is basically already stating to you, here are the features, and that's what you're trying to predict. That right there is the hardest part of any data science project, figuring out what the features are and figuring out what the target is. Once you get to this point, that's, that's easy. That's 10% of the work. Maybe a little more than 10%, but you get the picture. So my first task, and social discovery was not optimize function X, it was improve a dating game, and it was that subjective. Not really a dating game, it was a, a game of uh, social discovery, meaning somebody comes into a website and you suggest to them a person for them to say yes or no to. Kind of like recommendations of movies on Netflix, but a little harder because a movie doesn't have to like you back, and in this case, they should like you back. Um, also, if everybody watches just one movie and not that other movie, that movie's not going to be sad that nobody's looking at it, right? So there's all these different things to, to this problem that are not just simple like optimizing a single function, right? Which I'm just reiterating the problem of creating the proper target, uh, which is this first example. So the one I just talked about, the dating game, right? Improve a dating game. And when I got there, they saw this really weird behavior that... As the model got better, they started getting less users. If they started playing with the model and making it worse, they were getting more users, right? Daily active users. And they were optimizing a yes click, right? The chance that if I show you a person, you're gonna click yes. I can tell you right now, I don't need a model for that, right? I can get 100% accuracy. You just look at the hottest people in your website and you show them every single time to everybody that comes in. And you know who the hot people are because you know what the track record of every time they were shown, 99% of the time, they were clicked yes on. Done. Easy. Doesn't really solve the problem, right? Because you're not trying to optimize yes clicks. So my first job was to think, what are they actually trying to improve? Obviously, that's why the, the business went down, because very few people were getting yes clicks, right? Nobody else other than that small group of attractive people were getting yes clicks. And those people were overwhelmed with clicks coming into them, so they didn't respond yes back to all those people. So the people that gave a yes out weren't getting a yes back to them. So I figured out into breaking this into three simpler problems. Again, don't overcomplicate. It's really hard to build a model that optimizes what I'm talking about now, right? Not yes clicks, but optimizes this game. Like, how do you even define a target that makes everybody happy and increases yes and yes back? And so don't, don't try to build a model that does that unless you have a target that already does that, which I find it hard to believe. So we broke it down into three problems. One, when somebody's playing, they like to see attractive people. So at some point, you've got to predict it for them people that have high yes likelihood. Two, they want to get yeses back. They're saying a yes out. They would, they would like a probability that the person says yes back to them. And three, they want to have incoming yeses. That pretty much satisfies everybody that's playing this game. So the final result was building three different models and then figuring out a way to combine them, right? A model that just says 
for you, I think you, should, you have a high probability of saying yes to this person. Thing number two is, some of the people I'm gonna show you might have a lesser probability of you saying yes to them, but they have a really good chance that if you say yes to them, they'll say yes back to you. And the third model was saying, if I think this user needs some yeses in order to stay in the, in the website, I'm gonna give it to them by showing them to other people. And you figure that out by looking back at historical data and seeing the pattern. Some people, they don't care. They just play that game to, to look at people. So you see that there's no correlation between them receiving yeses and their usage. And some people, you see a nice correlation. The more yeses they get, they come back to your website versus not. And then build a model on that target. And now you can build them, you know, use that information. By the way, you can stop me at any point if you have any questions. So I, I you know, just explained this one. <clears throat> Second example, uh, delivering something that was not as good as what could be delivered. And this comes to that presentation aspect. Uh, this was in healthcare, and first few users of some of the readmission models, doctors, didn't trust or believe or understand random forests, even though I was guaranteeing them something like 12% increase in accuracy, which was phenomenal for that data set. And we couldn't sell it. So it's hard for some data scientists to, to actually say, okay, I'm going to build purposely a, a worse model. But listen, if you're not impacting, if you know, if the doctor's not going to trust it, he's not going to make a decision to the patient based on that. And then, so in essence, that model is useless and that is not better than the other model, right? It's better than the other model on your laptop, not in the real world. So the model that's being used is, is the better model. So I actually had to deliver a model that was not as accurate for that reason, for understanding uh, and, and, um, the other thing was uh, more targeted efforts. So that part was when you're doing that kind of work, readmission for hospitals, a lot of the patients are obvious cases where, okay, great, your model has 70% AUC, but nine tenths or maybe 99% of the people you predict correctly that are readmitting, they're the super obvious cases that the doctor would look at and be like, yeah, I know that guy's gonna readmit. He comes back every week, you know? He's like terminal. And that doesn't help the doctor. The ones that help the doctor are the really rare cases. So model, obviously, if you just train it with all the data, is going to focus on the bulk. And it's, it's not going to perform very well, especially if the features for those rare cases are very different and so rare that the signal to noise is so little. So then we had to build something that was focused and targeted on those populations that the doctors actually cared about. Third example, the silver platter. I got some clean data set. And 60 to 80% of it was mislabeled. So uh, that, that's the clean data set that came on the silver platter. Um, and thinking of uh, you know, creating ways on how to clean your data, uh, there's a lot of techniques there um, that um, it's called multiple instance learning. Can be used in some situations. It's not great, but simple bootstrapping sometimes can be really useful. The models will still learn some models. But what I mean by that is, something really simple. You get this data set, you have 10,000 things, 60% of them are mislabeled. Train a model a thousand times on different halves of the data. Every time selecting you know, a different half, train a model, predict on the second half. And you do that a thousand times. So then at the end of the day, for every instance in your data set, you have about 500 predictions. And then you see the things that are consistently predicted correctly. Those have a really like, like high likelihood of being the, the things that are correctly labeled if there's enough signal. And then you can you know, do that to clean your own data uh, in a pretty automatic way. Interviews in industry. Uh, so I've, I've grown you know, a couple teams and I've interviewed probably around 150 people and probably looked at at least 500 resumes. Uh, and so there's a few things that I've noticed. Um, number one, say I don't know. People get intimidated in an interview, right? And they do the usual nod along, right? You're following me, nod, nod, nod. And uh, you'll be caught because the guy is not trying to make conversation. The guy is asking if you know this because he's probably gonna ask you a question about it later in the interview. And if you're just nod along, don't, just don't do that. Uh, one of the best guys I ever interviewed said, I don't know more than anybody else I've ever spoken to. He knew what he knew and he knew what he didn't know. And it was very nice to, to hear that, you know, saying that, nope, never heard of that, don't know. Just say it, um, it'll save you from some awkward moments in an interview where I had a guy repeat the same thing three times. I asked him, here's the range of machine learning models, Bayesian family, 
function family, SVM family, neural networks, random forest. And then I started talking about some, I started adding in some more rare cases because I wanted to test, is he really just nodding along? So particle swarm optimization, restricted Boltzmann machines, stacked autoencoders. And he was nodding along to everything. And I was like, so, you know, in that area there, do you pretty much feel comfortable everywhere? And he was like, yeah. So I asked him a question about one of them. He said, well, not that one. So I said, okay, but the rest you know, or do you kind of know? He's like, no, the rest I know. So then I asked him about a second one. And he's like, uh, yeah, not that one either. <laughs> and it happened for a third time. I said, okay, so, you know, I, maybe you heard of these. I want to know which ones you know deeply, not just the ones you heard of. No, the rest I know deeply. And third time in a row, I go, okay, let's talk about this one. And there was just an awkward five minutes of silence trying to answer a question he didn't know. And so just don't do that. Engage with the interviewer. It's a conversation. And some interviewers go in there really cold and they, they don't want to engage. They're people at the end of the day. And if you bring them in a conversation, even if they didn't plan to do that, they will. And they'll help you, even if they didn't mean to. So unintentionally, they might help you solve the problems. They might, they might have a conversation. And it's always better. Think out loud so that they see that you're thinking. So if you don't get the answer correctly, that's not a problem. If they see that you're thinking and you're smart about how you're trying to solve the problem, right? Asking questions and, oh, can I break the stick, right? Is the stick this? Is the stick that? Instead of just staring at it silently and, you know, he doesn't get an idea of, like, what your thought process is. And then bringing him in, right? Asking questions and making, asking questions for clarification and seeing, oh, yeah, you know, did, did you think this is the right way to go? Um, they'll engage back with you. Um, so I really like people that can explain things without using terminology. I think terminology is a great way to hide what you don't know. You just throw a bitch, uh, bunch of uh, big words out there and, you know, you kind of hide. So explaining random force or explaining ensembles like, you know, darts, right? Darts on a board. That's really great. Um, I usually ask people that I interview, why is a random forest better than a decision tree? And they just throw terminology, bias, variance, you know, averaging. And, you know, I, wa I want something that, like, just explain why. And sometimes they say, well, you know, it doesn't overfit and it does this. And they explain how it's better, not why, right? So I'm usually just looking for some simple. This question sounds easy now, but I'd say people that actually came down to an interview in person after being screened on paper, two phone screens, and then came in person, probably less than a quarter answered that question acceptably. And it sounds easy. Why is a random forest better than the decision tree? And I'm not talking about people that were fresh. I'm talking about people that like masters at MIT, undergrad from Cambridge, worked at Google. Can't answer that question. So just thinking about it in, in simple terms, like how would you explain it? You know, really understand. Understand that you know the differences in like a decision boundary is different. You know the shape of what it can do, right? And not, not just the, the terms. Think about the business when you come into an interview. So look up at the company and think about ideas that you might have of what they can do. And it doesn't matter if the ideas are not usable or they, they might, see, you know, like they don't have even that data. It just shows you your creativity, right? Just, oh, we could do this if we had this data. I think it would be cool to do X, Y, and Z. Now, this is your job to learn about the culture and talk to multiple people. If they don't have multiple people interview you, you can ask, can I be interviewed by more people or can I talk to more people? You don't want to end up in a job that you don't like the culture. It's extremely important. You're going to be miserable uh, and, and it will happen. Um, if you don't fit in, you don't fit in. It doesn't matter the pay. I mean, you might make a little bit more than some other company, but you're going to be sad and you're going to end up getting out, you know, out of there because you don't fit in. Um, be persistent and show desire. So I love it when people, you know, will send emails after an interview, not just like, thank you for the talk, but I actually saying things that were insightful or showing how excited they are and how committed they are to that company, if they really are, right? Um, so that, that actually gets me to look at the resume a little more, right? If they send an email, if they reach out and they show that they're interested in that and they're not just like spraying resumes across the internet and you're just one of those that got hit, right, by that spray. Um, in industry, really good right now. Uh, I'm kind of, you know, I, I'm in the industry, but there's a lot of problems with it. And I'm, you know, not shy to, to point them out. So companies are desperate for people. The estimate right now in Silicon Valley is that there's two job openings for every one data scientist. Half. They need double the people there.
to fill the job positions that they have in Silicon Valley. I would say it's probably 80% of all the jobs in the country are in Silicon Valley within like a 20 mile radius. So I guess you should move to California <laughs> after you graduate. Um, um, most companies don't rely on data science and you need to understand if that's what you want. I joke around and I've said this many times, if all the data scientists in Silicon Valley went on a strike, it would take a while before anybody even noticed there was a strike. <laughs> Really, companies don't rely on data science. Um, and, you know, they get data science because it's a hot new term right now and it's cool. And they're not sure even what to do with it. And a lot of times you'll do a project and deliver even more than what the people asked for, and they won't use it. It's not on the budget. We would have to change this and that. Just shelve it over there. And you end up doing research. Uh, I spoke to the product managers at Facebook, for example, and we talked to him about. How do you interact with the data scientists, you know? How do you have that interaction of, you're the project manager, how do you come up with a project and give it to the data scientists and have the communication? And then I asked, you know, how, how do you come up with time estimates and deadlines? Because that's important. And he's like, oh no, nobody gives deadlines to, to, to data scientists at Facebook. They don't have deadlines. It's whenever anybody finishes anything that we get what they made, which is fine for some people, not fine for others. The people that I stole from those big companies like Google and people that took massive pay cuts. I mean, I hired a person that took pretty close to a six figure pay cut. And they did it because they didn't like to be in that environment. You know, I interviewed a guy on the phone from Google. He explained this project he did. And I said, how many people were on that project? He said, 12. And I said, how long did you do it? You know, were you in that project? Six months. And you know, did you deliver? He's like, no, we're still working on it. And then I thought, and I confirmed with the people in my team, and I said, is, am I wrong, but this is a three-week project, right, for like one guy? And they're like, yeah. And I said, why do you want to leave Google? And he's like, because of that. Like, <laughs> that's why, you know? Like, and I'm not saying that's everywhere. Obviously, Google has some really good teams, and I know some really good teams there. But different, you know, and that's fine for some people. Some people like to be in that research environment. It pretty much feels like academia, right? Um, if you do go to a company that relies on data science, there's going to be pressure. Right? And some people just don't like that pressure, but some people thrive under pressure. Um, most companies don't know what they want. As far as data science goes, in the interview process, they don't know what they're looking for. They don't even know if they need a data scientist. I've seen people that, you know, very politely, I turned them down, and, but I would never have hired them, even for a junior position, not even as an intern. Two months later, I see them as head of data science somewhere. Happened three times. I saw three people have that. Why? Because the companies don't even know how to interview sometimes. They end up with that. And that sounds kind of cool, you know, like somebody hears that and they're like, wait, I can just graduate and become head of data scientist, right? That would be awesome. But you got to think how that's going to work out. It's, it's not going to work out, right? Because you're not at that level yet. And what's going to happen is it's just going to fizzle out. And then either the company is not good and that's why they you know, made these decisions, or you're not going to perform what they want you to perform. It's just not going to work out. So it sounds exciting, but usually when I see that happen, it's like less than a year and the person is out. Either they quit or they got fired or the company went under. And then large versus small, do you want, you know, questions that you should be asking, right? Can you handle pressure? Uh, do you want what you do to matter? And uh, the larger the company, right, usually there's going to be less pressure. It's a bigger company. They're not going to die if you don't produce and uh, it's going to matter less. You're going to make smaller of an impact. But there's more conveniences, right? There's more people doing things for you. You're going to be not the data scientist that does everything, but you're going to be able to focus on the one thing that you really love versus in a startup, you're going to have to wear a lot of hats, basically, right? And there's going to be pressure, but to each his own. Um, there's time, and I one more rant that I want to get, get to, so I'm going to go really quickly through this. But I really believe this is super important, finding things from other fields and bring into your field, right? You don't have to invent something new. You just have to find something new for that field, something that was not meant to be used there, but nobody thought of crossing that over. So these are things that I actually did in industry. I used gene network algorithms that I had done in, uh, in uh, genomics to solve uh, looking at um, fraud detection for insurance for prescription drugs. Um, sequence alignment for genes aligning, you know, uh, genes and spam spotter. Um, this was really simple. 
it was basically at that social networking website, right? We get spammers that just advertise things or you know, not use the system properly. And you can catch the spammer after he starts spamming, but can you catch him before he starts spamming? And there was the suspicion of like, the way they create names, you have to go and create a first name, last name, and like login name, right? The way they choose those is semi-automated. It's not a person really choosing first name, last name, and choosing a, a login name. It's a bot. So can we catch that? So by doing some analysis on like aligning and figuring out the similarities between first name, last name, and, and username, we could spot almost 20% of the spammers with 90 some percent accuracy. And 20 some, 20 some percent sounds like a small number. But this is before they even spam, right? This is before, this is the moment they create their account. You're like, yep, spammer. Um, so that, that was pretty valuable. Um, Sentient, what I'm doing now, this is just some information about the company. Um, it's been around for a while. We just had about a year and a half ago, a uh, big round. Uh, you know, it's called rounds in Silicon Valley, like when a company goes out and asks for money from VCs. Usually it's A, B, and used to be only A, B, and C, but it's getting pretty ridiculous right now. There's A, B, C, D, E, E2, um, which is, I just don't, I just don't buy that much. You know, like if you're having to get that many rounds, there's, there's something weird happening there. Um, so a lot of deep learning, a lot of evolutionary algorithms. Um, a team that does trading. Um, uh, one of our differentiators is uh, like uh, very massively parallelized algorithms, both deep learning uh, and evolutionary algorithms. And so there's an internal team of taking in external requests, so proof of concept. So right now, we're working with an insurance company, and we're working with a big like uh, motor manufacturer to do predictive modeling on on maintenance. Uh, second team is the trading team, trading. Uh, third team is visual intelligence team, which I'll give you a little demo of that product and what it is and where it can grow to. Um, and yeah, I guess this talks a little bit about those teams. So I just wanted to show a little bit about that and then I can go on my rant that I still want to go on. So this is the product. So uh, this is one of the clients that's using our, our product and we're just now rolling out to some big um, online retailers like uh, names that you'd recognize more, more than this one. Uh, so the idea here is using deep learning to understand the visual aspects of products and then finding their relationships so that you can, if you have some shoe in mind that you saw on a TV show and you don't know the name or the style, you can just quickly start clicking and think, okay, you know, maybe you want a buckle to be in your boot, right? So I think I have to reload this page there. Based on the buckle, you can see most of these boots now have buckles and maybe, um, let's see, you want a taller boot with buckle. Let's see what's going to happen. See, now they're all tall boots, and most of them have buckles. So very quickly, it took me three clicks, and now I have really tall boots with buckles. Um, and that's done with just deep learning on the images and then finding their relationships. And I think, I think this is going to grow, um, obviously, to other products. We already have rolling out like a ton of other consumer products uh, and apparel. But also, like, how many times did I personally shop for a house and you have this idea, a vision of like what the house looks like, and that's important. But when you go to these websites, you can say square footage, price, number of bedrooms. You can't say like, I want it to look like this. If you could just drive down a street and see the house of your dreams, take a picture, upload it and say, show me pictures of houses that look like this house, right? That'd be great. Uh, so that's that. Now I'm going to go in my last final rant before I open up to questions. And my rant is about deep learning. Um, I love it. It's fantastic. But I'm not in the boat, like I have a good foot outside that boat because if it sinks, I'm safe. Um, the reason is, I think there's a huge chasm between where deep learning is and where we think deep learning is based on papers, articles, and magazines. It's, it's massive, right? I don't know if you guys follow ImageNet, the competition, right, to detect classify objects. Two years ago, it was a big milestone. We beat human level detect our classifying objects. It's a joke. Um, the classification task is to say, here's a picture, what's the object? And first of all, the manual curation of that data set was done by one graduate student who's probably pulling all-nighters and, you know, not the best, right, measure of all humanity. Uh, secondly, again, common sense. I don't care what that guy did or who did that task, okay? Just think for a second. ImageNet winner right now is... I mean, Google, Baidu, Facebook, the big ones, right? 97% accuracy. 97% of the time, they can tell the correct object. 
that's top five pick. That means the algorithm has to guess five times to get 97% accuracy. The top one accuracy is around 70%. What was the last time that you saw an object and you had to guess five times to get it right? You see literally billions of objects a day, sub objects. Are you looking at me? There's eyes, eyebrows, hair, shoes, shoelaces, fingernails. Fing like how many objects are you misclassifying right now? Right? Human level of misclassification is literally like I couldn't I say 99999 for the rest of the day and it would be, wouldn't be enough nines. Billions of objects a day. What was the last time you went, oh, look at that napkin. It's a lion. Run. You know, we wouldn't be alive as a species today if we made those kinds of mistakes. And deep learning models still make them. So for me to see people talking about it like, oh, yeah, it's better than humans. It's really like 97 top five. And, and you see papers coming out with mistakes like sloth. As a fairly triangular, uh, uh, like a triangle shaped head, two round black eyes, a round black nose. It's ma mainly like a beige color. So it's like this triangle with three black dots. And finally found out that if they feed it images of scones, it thinks it's sloths, uh, raisin scones that have three raisins in it. Um, they also found another pastry that confuses with chihuahua, because chihuahua is a thing, three, you know, three black dots. So uh, there's a whole paper on pastry mistakes. That was not the title of the paper, but that's what they found. Um, so we're not that stupid, right? Like just, uh, and papers, like they like to show the good things. So the other thing that's really hot right now is question answering from deep learning. Um, all the papers are doing it. So show me a picture, ask a question in text, deep learning model will answer the question. It looks amazing. I was sitting down one day in the office and I was watching people play with the demo. And they were looking at a picture, of a guy playing tennis, and they said, how many people in the picture? One. What sport is the person playing? Tennis. What's the color of the ball? Yellow. Is the person wearing a white shirt? Yes. I was like, wow, right? Amazing. And then I thought, okay, wait a minute. Questions that these people are asking are biased because they're looking at the picture, right? Like one of the biggest things I had in my last job, Banjo, right, was false positive rate. I took ImageNet best model, to detect fire trucks. Fire, the, the data set in ImageNet is not a real data set. It's these are the thousand objects, and every picture belongs to one of these classes. And it's nice and balanced, right? So accuracy on fire trucks is almost perfect. I had Banjo data, which was all of social media every day, every second, every minute, 30,000 images. You know how many fire trucks really come up in social media? It's like one in 10,000 if you're lucky, right? So now the balance of false positives is massive. You now have 99,000 or maybe you know, 10,000 false uh, not fire trucks for a fire truck. I used ImageNet. For every one fire truck that I got as a positive, I would get about six or seven not fire trucks. And that's, that was state of the art, right? The class imbalance is a huge thing. And knowing how to test your data, right? It's the same thing with the question answering thing. I thought outside the box and I was like, if I wanted to ask, hey, show me a picture of a guy playing tennis, I would have to feed million pictures in to get that picture out. So I need to be able to ask the question, is the guy playing tennis? Or what sport is the guy playing? When I don't know a guy's playing the sport. So I started asking questions that made no sense to the, to the, to the picture, right? Same picture, and I said, how many bears in the picture? It said two. <laughs> how many cars in the picture? Two. How many dinosaurs in the picture? Two. And then I said, is the dinosaur red? Yes. Is the bear <laughs> driving the car? Yes. Because yes and two are the most common answers. Usually when you phrase a question, it's a yes. Like, is the guy playing tennis? Yeah, the guy's playing tennis. That's how you're going to demo. You don't even think about it, right? Would you ask, is the guy not playing tennis? You know, that's how people react. And so the demos are really cleverly made. And you start asking questions and you see two is very common. So it always answers two. It could have said zero, zero bears. That was the correct answer, right? Um, so then I, it was just embarrassing to see, like, once you get out of that scope, it was, it was you know, a joke. Um, which is fine, you know, it's academia, but again, what really worries me is that, that distance between what people perceive and what it actually is, right? That's why very few people are actually using deep learning in production. I mean, even Google, they released it, right, like last year, and it wasn't even from their research teams. They had a separate team to do just a production deep learning, even though they have Google Brain and Google DeepMind. DeepMind that they bought for like $500 million and they're not even using their products. I mean, which is fine it's for research, but so I'll stop. I could keep going, but I'll stop. Um, questions? That's pretty much the end of the talk.
don't know how to hire them, they don't know what to do with them, and it's not central for their mission. It's just a fad that there's zero job security in the future. Yeah, so I can say that again. What? No. Yeah. 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 Oh, is it a fad? Um, it's a little bit of a bubble. I think the bubble is more on the supply than on the demand. I think the demand is real. I think eventually they'll find out what can be done. And so I don't think the demand is going to go down, even if they start getting disappointed. I think the supply is where the bubble is. I think the amount of people calling themselves data scientists is very large. And the amount of real data scientists is very small. And so there's this weird bubble of like, you know, all these data scientists and really it's only about 20% of them that are. Companies hire them, they get disenfranchised by the idea. I mean, the company that I was in, Banjo, they hired some top data scientists from, I shouldn't say the name of the company. And then they got three guys for work for that guy and they had a team of four data scientists for 13 months, for a whole year, and they produced nothing. And they fired those four guys, and they waited a whole year before deciding to do data science again. And then that's when they brought me in. And you know, I was gonna hire a whole team, and they were like, yeah, but let's slow down. Let's not start hiring just yet. Let's see if you're gonna produce something first. You know, and then as I started producing, I started hiring. But it took them a year to recover from that, and that's gonna be happening, right? That is not just one case. It's gonna be happening around, um, but the actual demand? No, I think every company should use a data scientist. Yeah. So how much help do you get from domain like knowledge, like people who know the domain well? How does it work out like the generation insurance company? How much support do you get from the people who know about the importance of you know certain domain related ideas? It's helpful to help understand the data, analyze the data. Um, a lot of times you won't get it. Uh, if you're in a company that does just that, then yeah. Um, I like to, you should also look outside that data, right? That data is after decades of assumptions and not looking everywhere because they couldn't because there wasn't computational power to do so and they had to focus on important things. Through Kaggle, right, again, that example, um, over the last few years, all the big companies put their stuff there, right? GE and, and AT&T and I mean you name it every big company put their stuff there and they had some of these competitions were very specific to fields that required physics and electrical engineering and this and that and what you know speaking to to the, the Kaggle president it was the surprise that all these companies didn't think that the models they were going to get out of Kaggle were going to beat their expert models and they did every single time data that was like it was scrubbed so that people getting the data a lot of the times didn't even know what the features really were, had no expertise and knowledge in the field, and they were beating those guys because they were just looking in more places, right? They were just saying, just look everywhere, construct all these billion features, try to use everything. So that will help you, and you should use that, but you should also realize that they are not going to know how to build the best model. You, you should. Yeah. Skill set? Skill set of entry level data scientists. Programming is extremely important. Uh, math, statistics, machine learning, data mining. Uh, just, just. <laughs> I think, I think uh, the ability to learn is one of the things that I look for the most. So like read this paper, can you understand it? Like right now, can you understand it? And if you don't, go to the paper that explains something that was done before this paper, you know. So just reading a lot, like a lot, every night. Look through three, four, five papers. Don't have to read the whole thing, just look at them. Just look at them, read the abstract, and then you'll find something that you find interesting, and then Google it, read. Just keep absorbing knowledge, because then you'll get used to it. You'll get used to, maybe I read this and I don't know all those formulas, but I can still make sense of it. And I know what they're trying to do, and I know what they're doing, even though I can't get that part of the formula down. And you don't have to understand that. But yeah, I mean, you need to know some math and stats. You need to know some programming. And, and you need to know uh, general like, you know, machine learning techniques. Um, whether you're going to become a specialist or not, that's up to you. So I could hire some guys that know just deep learning and image because there's positions for that. 
not just deep learning specific, but some positions are going to be more like um, you should know programming really well because it's algorithms. And if you build algorithms that are not optimized code wise, they're not going to do so well. And if you try to pass that algorithm along to an engineer that doesn't know any of the science, it's a lot more bugs that way. So having a data scientist that knows how to code in C, it's really fast, right? Again, it depends. And if you're going to a startup, you should be a generalist because you're going to be doing a lot of things. You're going to be the one that builds a scraper, or you're going to be the one that cleans the data and accesses the database. You're going to be the one that builds a model and might even write some pseudo or semi-production code. So you better be able to be just scrappy. Yep. Yeah. So tools that I use day to day. Uh, Python is really popular right now in Silicon Valley. Uh, everybody's using it. Um, depending on the uh, on what it's doing, I mean, if it's building a simple model, then yeah, great. Like I said, if it's an algorithm that actually does something that's not just a model that you apply and predict, then Python's not going to be the fastest. You want to do C or Cython, you know. Um, Deep learning has its own tools, Torch. Although Torch is more academic, I would never use that in production. I don't think anybody should or is. Uh, Keras, which is built on top of Theano, which is on Python. Uh, TensorFlow, Google's trying to push that really hard. I'm still waiting and seeing process. Cafe is still king. Uh, it's not as flexible as the others, but if, it, if it's something you want to do that's already part of Cafe, then it's, it's the best one to use. But yeah, in general, like if you know at least one or two languages, make Python one of them, you know? But uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, one more online viewer has asked, what would you suggest to somebody who's graduating soon uh, about the ways you can keep up with latest news or techniques in data science? Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess it depends where you live, right? Some places have a lot of meetups and a lot of great, great forums for, for people to meet. Silicon Valley is surely one of those. Um, and uh, the work environment that, that I, places I've worked at had that environment where everybody there was like just crazy for papers. Um, if a paper was more than three days old and you shared it with somebody, they, they already knew about it. Somebody already shared it in the group. Uh, it happened to me literally like last week. Somebody, it was April 17th or 18th, and somebody shared a paper that came out April 15th. And I was mad that I didn't know about it. Um, so I, you know, it really depends that in my case, I was lucky. It was the work environment that I was in. There's tons of people like that. So they were constantly just researching stuff and looking for papers and it's not necessary, right? I mean, most companies, to be honest, don't need anything that's razor, you know, cutting edge. They just need some good old data science. And so many times the really simple models are going to, most times simple models are going to do just fine. And you don't really need to completely innovate like and make some new kind of deep learning function, activation function, or, you know, gradient uh, method or backpropagation methodology or something. So, but yeah, I mean, other than being part of, uh, you know, these meetups, maybe being surrounded by people that do the same and maybe a group of friends that you want to just constantly say that you're going to at least every day share a couple papers around. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, data engineers. So yeah, my, my team was basically split in half, half data engineers, half data scientists. Um, they need to be much stronger coders, right? They need to be software, like software engineers. Data engineers need to know coding much better than a data scientist. Um, a lot of times in companies, they're going to be the ones responsible for getting the final thing or model or idea and putting it in production um, or you know, coding it in a more robust way and things like that. Uh, or doing the, the work of getting the data, preparing it. Um, so a lot more coding, I would say. Uh, it's always great that they understand data science or at least are curious and you know, willing to learn. Not necessary that they know data mining as well. Yeah. Uh, as we said, uh, deep learning are all the that the image classification comes Yeah. Localization. Within the image, you mean? Detection? Yeah, those are two very, very hard problems. Uh, um, so he asked about 
classification versus detection. Classification is, here's a picture of something, tell me what that something is. Detection is, here's a picture, find X in the picture, right? Find a dog in the picture or a shoe, in which case it's probably a small portion of the picture that's the shoe and not the main prominent object. Um, detection is just harder. I mean, based on the data sets alone, right? Classification data sets already have like one very nice viewable object. And you just have to tell the difference. Is it a dog or a cat or a chair? But you know for sure it's a dog or a cat or a chair, right? Maybe it's a thousand things. You know it's one of those thousand things. Of course, when you're using it on other data, then it's not the case and you can apply it to other things. But detection, right? Like it could, it, it's just usually it's smaller, less pixels representing that thing. That already makes it hard, right? Most machine learning models are deep learning models. They don't start off with a very big picture, right? Most of the ones being used today use 224 by 224 pixels. That is crazy tiny, really tiny. And some of the, the detection ones, though, do use uh, slightly higher resolution of images. But uh, it's, it's just a harder task. There's more possibility of false positives. Um, so it, it just doesn't look as impressive when you're showing you know, a paper on it. Um, yeah. But it's also harder to train. It's trickier. There's a lot of techniques. You should look at a paper called Faster RCNN. I, that's a really good one. So. Yeah, so I have a question about the, uh, the, uh, the job of data science. When the company uh, look at the randomness of the potential candidates, how much emphasis do they put on the past experience, like the uh, work experience, the internship experience? What if uh, candidates have no zero uh, internship experience? Yeah, that's hard. Um, that's hard. I'm thinking like when I look at resumes. Um, and I, I mean, yeah, most, most, uh, most likely, uh, you know, I look for people that have an experience because it's such a new field, right? There's not, till recently, right, there's not many degrees actually in data science. Um, well, now there is uh, some, but what I look for is projects. I don't care if, where they did the project, but if you show me that you've done a lot of projects, maybe participated in a ton of Kaggle competitions, or you wrote code that does something, you have a GitHub page with it, you know, that to me is super valuable. It shows initiative. You didn't have to do those things and you're doing it. You're a hard worker and maybe the code is impressive and you know, the projects are, you got a good result on Kaggle. And that's equally valuable for me when I'm looking at somebody that's coming out of school. If they did a lot of things on their own and they, you know, Yeah, if it's if a project that I that I think is more kind of like industry, right? I mean, projects that are more like you know, it's work for like publishing a paper. That's a little different, um, which is fine, but it's just a different, you know, just different twist on, on the project. But yeah, projects like that, um, yeah, they're valuable. I, that's the one thing I'd be looking for in a resume. Yeah. 